It has been two years since the world was plunged into the unknown by the COVID-19 pandemic. Remote work, online school, mask mandates and vaccines and social distancing became the order of the day. South Africa, Ghana, Kenya have lifted their COVID restrictions, but have we really turned the corner? Has COVID-19 become an endemic yet? This week on Our Voices, we are taking a closer look at how the world attempts to transition back to normal amid the rise of new COVID variants. Hello, I'm Amina Aliyu and welcome to Our Voices. Two years after Africa identified its first case of COVID-19 in Nigeria, the World Health Organization believes that if current trends continue, the continent can control the pandemic. However, the WHO warns that continued vigilance is key for getting back to what one would deem to be a normal life. Ghana recently reopened its borders to bolster their economy. Schools are reopening with few restrictions in Uganda and Zimbabwe. Kenya and South Africa are ending their states of disaster brought on by the coronavirus pandemic and loosening mask mandates as they are set to receive vaccines from the African Union. South Africa's tourism industry is seeing a return to normal after the Omicron COVID variant brought international travel to a halt last year. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has removed COVID restrictions and tour operations are hoping that will bring a surge of holiday goers and help fight record unemployment. Linda Givetish reports from Johannesburg. And then why today we not go to stadium? It's because of uh, the pandemic. Tour groups arriving in Johannesburg are small, but tour companies are thankful they're here and hopeful that tourism is rebounding after two years of pandemic damage. Tourism took an especially hard hit when the COVID Omicron variant halted international travel in November. But that has changed now that the infection rate is low and dropping, and most COVID restrictions have been lifted. From um, the past two weeks, I'm smiling. I can say now, I can look after my problems. I can say now, sign is back to the field. It's because I see I've been getting tours, and we are happy that borders are open, flights are coming in, but slowly and surely getting there. South Africa, the country hardest hit by the pandemic in Africa, scrapped COVID test requirements in March for fully vaccinated visitors. Restrictions on large gatherings have also been eased, allowing visitors to attend sporting and arts events again. And we are seeing um, quite a significant um, uptake and, and flights being scheduled. I would imagine the 2022 high season from September through to March will be pretty much um, at a pre at a at a pre uh, COVID level. While South African business is rebounding, there is still a long road to recovery, and not just for tourism. Jobless numbers for the fourth quarter of 2021 saw unemployment hit a record 35 percent. The most important uh, reason why we have high levels of unemployment is because of lack of economic growth. Even if you have weakly skilled people in your country and even if they have all sort of other problems in the economy but if the economy grows strongly people will find a job somewhere. Economists warn South Africa won't see major growth anytime soon but in March it did secure nearly 23 billion dollars in investments at the annual South African Investment Conference. The local business industrial areas are opening up for people and then more offices are opening up. Remember people used to work indoors at home but now we see even the traffic volume on roads is getting more open, more bigger. It tells that something is changing. We are moving out of the disaster slowly but surely. President Cyril Ramaphosa in March said South Africa would soon remove the last remaining significant COVID measure, a national state of disaster that regulates the country's COVID rules. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Johannesburg. Vaccines are playing a key role in the battle to overcome the coronavirus. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed stark vaccine inequities among high and low income nations and is underscoring Africa's dependence on nations outside of the continent for vaccines. A new initiative in Senegal, however, hopes to reduce the inequity and make the continent more vaccine self-sufficient. Senegal administered its first doses to the public in March 2021, months after COVID-19 vaccines had become available in the West. 
Since then, supplies have repeatedly run dry in Senegal and other African countries that have relied on the international community for the vaccines. Today, just 11% of Africans are vaccinated, compared to 64% in the U.S. and 85% in the U.K., according to government statistics. But scientists aim to change that. The Pasteur Institute of Dakar has partnered with BioNTech to build a production facility for its mRNA vaccines. So the need to make sure that we have control over supplies is something that is critically important in terms of health security. Having a different level of protection in different parts of the world won't help actually control and, and end this pandemic. Africa currently imports 99% of all its vaccines. The new facility is due to open later this year and produce 300 million COVID vaccines annually. South Africa has announced a similar partnership with Moderna. The Institute hopes to manufacture vaccines not just for the next pandemic, but also for endemic diseases such as measles and polio. The standards are indeed getting higher and higher. It requires a level of human resources and skills that are extremely high as well. It's not always within reach or easily found in Africa because it's a new technology. But Dakar's Institut Pasteur already produces yellow fever vaccines. Scientists there have been manufacturing them for decades. The Pasteur Institute has a lot of experience producing vaccines. The yellow fever vaccine was developed and produced there. With their vaccine development expertise, there is nothing to prevent them from producing another that's developed elsewhere. Misinformation about COVID-19 vaccines has run rampant throughout Africa, Bajan added. So vaccines made in Africa by Africans could help increase trust and in the number of people willing to get the jab. Annika Hammerschlag for VOA News, Dakar, Senegal. It's time for a break. When we return, we'll examine the global effort to help Africa bridge the vaccination gap. My Our Voices colleagues will join me to discuss with World Health Organization Special Envoy for Act Accelerator, Dr. Iowa de Alakija. Before we go to break, we hit the streets of Nairobi to get Kenya's take on the COVID-19 restrictions being lifted. And we ask them, what are the concerns and hopes in getting back to normal? Let's watch. My concern is what happens between now and August, given that there's going to be a lot of movement, a lot of crowds. So that's my concern, that we might see a spike, especially schools with schools opening and the campaigns. And then my hope is that uh, at the end of it all, by the time we're done with the elections and the restrictions, uh, you know, off completely, we might go back to complete normalcy. It is upon you to decide whether to put on mask for your better health, because COVID is now for you to decide, not for the government. It is upon you to decide what, is, what do you want for your life. I'm very ha much happy to see that uh, uh, the, our government, that restriction of uh, COVID-19 has removed now. We are now free to move on with our own life. On VOA Our Voices, women are using their voices to empower, to nurture, to educate, to stand up in any language. Amajiku yachu, dims action. Mario yemu, mazwi edu, our voices. Welcome back, you're watching Our Voices. In late March, Congress reached an agreement on the $10 billion deal for a new round of COVID-19 response funding, abandoning the $5 billion earmarked for America's global response that President Joe Biden proposed. VOA White House correspondent Patsy Wudakuswara spoke to VOA producer Abby Sun on what it means for African countries that are most in need to end the pandemic. Thank you, Patsy, for joining us. Now we know that Congress reached agreement there's no funding for the U.S. COVID global response. What does it mean? So essentially what this means is that the U.S. government has no ability to fund its program to help vaccinate the world. As you know, the U.S. has pledged 1.2 billion doses of vaccines, about 500 doses of those has been delivered, and the rest, roughly 700 million, are essentially, sit some of them are sitting in warehouses, and we may not have the funding to deliver those doses into the people who need them, because as you know, 
Donating vaccines is not as easy as dropping a container of vaccine doses at an airport and then leave it at that. You need to support uh, countries with the cold chain storage. You need to train vaccinators. You need to get people to be able to sign up for vaccinations. And that is the money that is currently lacking in the budget. So essentially, one of the key programs that is uh, USAID, the US uh, Agency for International Development, has this program called Global Facts, which they just launched in December. And initially to 11 countries, all of them in the African continent. And a USAID spokesperson told me point blank that by September, they're going to run out of money for these programs, which means these programs that they just have started in December is going to run out of money and they cannot expand it to the additional 20 countries that they had planned. Thank you, Patsy. We know that the White House proposed this bill last year and there's been ongoing negotiation. So how does it that we came to the point that there's no funding for the COVID global response? So initially, USAID had asked for $19 billion to support vaccinations around the world. Now, out of that money, that's already been pared down to $5 billion. This is uh, a supplemental funding from the uh, 2022 budget. Senate uh, Democrats and Republicans were able to agree on a $10 billion domestic funding. This is to support COVID response in the U.S., but could not agree on the additional $5 billion for international response. And the reason is because Republicans had insisted that any any additional COVID-19 funding have to come from unspent money from the six trillion dollar package that had already been agreed on and Democrats simply could not find ways to scrounge up those five billion dollars for international response and right now we just simply do not have the money to uh, continue on our international programs. What can we expect from the White House? Are we expecting something you know in the future come down to the pipeline in the next few months? Well, I asked uh, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, you know, what's 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 a plan B here? What are we going to do? What are we going to do with all those 700 million doses of vaccines that we may not be able to deliver to countries? And she said that we're not there yet. They haven't, they haven't given up. And I think there is an understanding both from the administration as well as lawmakers on the Hill that international COVID response is important not just to help vaccinate the world, but also to keep Americans safe from new variants. According to a United Nations report, COVID vaccine supplies have risen significantly and Africa is struggling to expand its rollout. Only 11% of the population is fully vaccinated. In Malawi, only 7% of the population has been vaccinated against the coronavirus, one of the lowest rates in Africa. Joining me to discuss how governments can better roll out vaccines are my co-hosts Ndimiaki, Simnish, Ariane, and our guest Dr. Ayodi Alakija a member of the African Union Vaccine Delivery Alliance and the Special Envoy for ACT Accelerator. The Biden administration's key program to help vaccinate the world is in danger of grinding to a halt. What does this mean for the African continent? Um, thank you. The Biden-Harris Biden, Biden administration um, have been really, really excellent in so far in their response to not just Africa, but to the global, the, the understanding the global needs and understanding that this pandemic affects us all and that unless all of us are protected and all of us are vaccinated, none of us are safe. So it is a shame and it is sad, sad to see that there are political hindrances in the way I, of course, I can't speak to the politics of the matter. But what I can say is that the help to Africa so far has been invaluable, both bilaterally to, to countries on the African continent, including Kenya, Nigeria and others, and also multilaterally through COVAX, um, which is the vaccine pillar of the ACT Accelerator, of which I'm special envoy and co-chair. Now, uh, Dr. Alakija, how, what, what are your thoughts on what the WHO revealed that up to 65% of Africans have had COVID? Those are maybe even a small estimate that it's likely more than 100 times more have not been reported. You know, Africa has always been said to have, you know, gotten away from the whole, you know, scourge of, of, of uh, the COVID pandemic that has hit so badly in the Western world and Asia. That's a great question. You know, I have been saying, and many of us have been saying for months, for over a year now, that 
we were flying blind on the African continent. Nobody knew whether people had COVID or not. Everybody was going about their own business because there were no tests, because this issue of diagnostics equity that I've just spoken about, you know, in, in, in Abuja, in Nigeria, where I am today, in Lagos, it costs 100 to $150 for a, for a single test. How many people can afford that? People were testing just for travel. People, there, were very, there was very limited availability of, of what we call rapid self-tests, you know, that can easily help you if you're going out, do a quick swab and check to see what your status is. We haven't had access to those. So when the world was saying, oh, Africa has gotten away with it, you know, I'd be very vocal about saying that had COVID started on the African continent, the world would have locked us away and thrown away the key. Because clearly the value of a life in Nairobi or the value of a life in Kampala or the value of a life in Lagos or, 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 or Kinshasa is worth far less than the value of a life in DC, in London, in New York. So I believe that when we go and look at excess deaths after this pandemic, once it's all done, we will, there, there's going to be a huge reckoning. I think we as African people have been too complacent about this and, um, and therefore the rest of the world cannot value what we ourselves do not value and hold dear. Mm. Uh, in terms of uh, exposure prediction, the World Health Organization said that two thirds of all Africans had been exposed to COVID-19. Uh, this could mean that in September, 2021, rather than the 8.2 million, I believe, that were uh, infected, it might have been, it could have been then 800 million infections, if I'm not mistaken. Could you shed a bit of light on that exposure rate um, and maybe even go further and tell us what your predictions are in terms of a year from now with this pandemic? Look, I think there's there's nothing really that surprising about, about that rate because we've seen it all over the world. We saw it. Look, let me give you some testing statistics. Nigeria, in total, the entire pandemic had conducted about 4 million tests. The US, as of the same date, had conducted over 1 billion. That same week, the UK was conducting 6.6 .6 million tests per week. You can't measure what you don't count, what you're not testing for, because you're not counting it. So yes, the, the whole world. I mean, if you look at how people are crammed into buses in, in Nairobi or in Kinshasa or in Lagos, I think us and our public health leaders and our political leaders wanted to show that, no, Africa is doing okay with this. It's not that Africa didn't do okay. It's just that it's a pandemic. It doesn't seem like the death rate is as high on the continent. I went to Burundi, I went to Nairobi, but their morgues and their hospitals are not showing the death rate as high as it is in the West. Why is that? Are there, do they have a variant that doesn't kill as many people? Or Because if there was such a high death rate, we would see it. We would see constant burying of people. Uh, maybe you can answer it together with Orion's questions. What are your expectations going forward for the continent in terms of vaccine equity you talked about earlier and the mobilization of support uh, for resources? In terms of the death rate, I think that is a very dangerous place to go in terms of assumptions. And I tend not to go there. I think we have cultures across Africa who bury immediately the dead. There were part, there was times in parts of various countries in Africa where there were overflowing mortuaries. Um, I think what you saw in the Western countries, going back to the metric by which we measure, what you saw was a lot of hospital admissions. We don't have those in Africa. So unfortunately, our deaths, you know, would have been a lot more unnoticed, like I said earlier on. In terms of predictions for the future for Africa, I think there's also another point we haven't talked about. COVID is not just one and done. It's not a binary equation. It's not somebody dies or they don't die. There is also long COVID. And my concern is how many more of those, especially of the young, your 18 to 40 year olds, how many young women across Africa are today struggling with looking after their kids and going to work? What is it going to do to our workforce? What is it going to do to the economically productive segment of our society? And we don't have access to Paxlovid. We don't have access to an, a, other anti, antiviral drugs. We don't know as a continent. So we are political leaders, to my mind, are following the drumbeat of the West. Oh, take off your masks. Stop, stop your, your social distancing. But it is dangerous. And my message is that it's not over.
It is not over. We wish it were, but sadly it is not. And we need to keep protecting ourselves and our populations. It's time for a break, but first, how much more effort do we need to put into the fight against COVID-19 to truly overcome the pandemic? Are you still taking precautions? Please share your views on our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our handle is at VOA Our Voices. We are also on WhatsApp. Our number is on your screen. When we return, we'll introduce you to an African woman arming others to help combat the COVID-19 pandemic in our Women to Watch segment. Stay with us empowerment and humanity towards a better world. Economic and social progress of every society. Facts and information from key players rather than spectators in politics, business, science and technology. City, rural, educated, all underprivileged. We care and we listen to what matters to you. Your voices are our voices. Welcome back. You're watching Our Voices. It's time for our Women to Watch segment with Simonesh Yokoye. Simonesh? Thanks, Amina, and hello, everyone. I'm happy to bring you this week's Women to Watch segment. The outbreak of coronavirus pandemic two years ago sparked a fear that it could spread in Kibara. Africa's largest urban settlement located in Nairobi, Kenya. Now, one woman is arming other women to be on the front lines in the fight against coronavirus pandemic in Kibara. Her name is Ida Ogogo. She is the primary healthcare head of CFK Africa, an international nonprofit organization that rose above the challenge, helping not only to contain the virus, but also train health workers and improve hygiene practices. Last October, she touted for her team's tireless effort to distribute nearly 180 COVID-19 vaccines in a week, with a goal to administer 30 shots per day. While overseeing CFK's community health projects, Ida says women have long been key on public health efforts whether by encouraging hand washing or taking steps to ensure the health of their children. Victoria Amunga reports from Nairobi on her efforts. Dense population, unhygienic conditions and lack of safe water supply made Kenya's Kibera slum an ideal breeding ground for the coronavirus when COVID-19 hit Kenya in March 2020. Frederick Otieno, a healthcare worker in this vulnerable community, says he faced direct exposure to a virus, which at the time scientists knew almost nothing about. It was something new that we have never experienced. Then there were a lot of stories about many deaths that were happening in, in the, some other countries. So, like when I was placed at the COVID center, I was very careful with those patients. It's a challenge CFK Africa, an aid group in the slum, directly took on. Authorities at the aid group say they built on 20 years of working in Kibera to educate residents and community health workers about keeping safe. When COVID-19 came in 2020, everyone was scared and uh, people kept wondering what would this be when it reaches Africa, how would it be? So we took that opportunity to ensure we educate the people we have served over these years because they have trust in us. And developing that trust over the years then made them um, take the information we give them, not with a pinch of salt, but very, very keenly. And that is why when we provide the information, they listen. To give slum dwellers access to vaccines, CFK Africa partnered with the Kenyan Ministry of Health and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to distribute the coronavirus vaccine to clinics in Kibera. More than 4,000 residents have received jabs at the CFK Africa's three clinics. I decided to come here because first, I live nearby. It's a community health center. Then their services are good. If you go to other hospitals, you may fail to get the medicine. But each time I come here, I get the medication I need. Kibera is home to an estimated 250,000 people, according to national data. Community aid groups such as CFK Africa hope not only to reach more residents with information on staying safe during the pandemic, but also vaccinate most of them in the future. 
Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. Thank you, Victoria. Do you know of any other woman who has been on the front lines of COVID pandemic by addressing some of the many concerns impacting their community? If so, please let us know. Share your thoughts and comments using the hashtag VOA Our Voices. Until next time, I am Simeni Shekoye. Thanks, Simenesh. Let's go to the Ivory Coast, where the Intercultural Circus Festival of Abidjan is underway following reduced events last year because of the pandemic. Touted was West Africa's largest circus festival. The events bring together performers from across Africa and beyond. Henry Wilkins reports from Abidjan. West Africa is beginning to open up to the world again. As COVID-19 travel restrictions are lifted, cultural events like the Intercultural Circus Festival of Abidjan, or RICA, are returning. The festival was held last year, but it was much smaller because of the pandemic. RICA founder Chantal Djeje says COVID-19 made organising the festival very difficult. Last year, we wanted to keep the festival going, but there were very few companies from the Guinea-Burkina sub-region. And this year, the festival has become more colourful because we have nine companies and 57 artists from many different countries. This year, RICA is hosting acts from Lebanon, France, Morocco, Guinea, as well as a troupe of acrobats known as Atufa from Burkina Faso. Atufa's artistic director says he faced obstacles becoming a circus performer. Why not? It took courage to take this initiative because my parents hate me doing this sport. If I was not here, I would be in the village right now. Atufa's performance reflects the ongoing war in Burkina Faso against armed terrorist groups, says Tanyan. It is through our movements and the performance that we manage to express the war. It changes people's lives because there is a war in our country. The festival, said to be the largest of its kind in West Africa, has helped promote African circus performers internationally, says Rika director Dijeje. There are many from the continent who have gone on to Cirque du Soleil, and now they want to come back to the continent and create a circus that is much more of their identity, that is linked to African traditions. The festival is taking place as West African nations, including Ivory Coast, are dropping mandatory COVID-19 testing for arriving travellers who are fully vaccinated. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Abidjan, Ivory Coast. That's our show for this week. On behalf of everyone at The Voice of America, I'm Amina Aliyu. Thanks for watching and stay safe.